Good evening. Welcome to the Laughing Monkey Music Show. Tove and Alan Hines, how are you? I'm good. Nice to meet you, Sean. Well, I'm glad to have you on. I've been hearing hearing your music for a while, and I've known you on and off. But you know, to me, you're you're another one of uh, music's best kept secrets, where you. you play with a lot of established artists, but you're not as mainstream as you should be. You know, and I, you might be yeah. able to agree with me on that one. I've, um, I've kind of noticed that too. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I understand it all. It's a uh, well, I know, but I'm a, it's I'm a fan, and I can have an opinion that that can say that you know without you sounding bad, <laughs> right? Without me, without me, I would right. never say that, of course. But but, yeah. but as a hard worker, you do put the work and the effort in, and you in any industry, you you want to get a, mm. you know credit. I mean, no, it definitely means a lot. You know, when anybody notices if I've meant anything to anybody's life, that that's kind of what I do it for. Um, it's if somebody writes me and says says this one song means you know. It's, brings tears to my eyes or this song is great or whatever that's man it feels good you know that's kind of what I it's not only my own personal release and a song but it's also I get satisfaction getting feedback from people and I realize also that I'm a hard sell because you and I were kind of talking briefly about um you know I'm, I have a manager now I guess he's a manager he's a guy who kind of financially helped me out this last cd and he was saying Alan you know you're a hard sell because you're not really you're not a blues guy and you're not really fusion, you're not traditional no. jazz, and you're not smooth jazz, and you're not really progressive rock. It's like, you know, I'm kind of a, so I kind of represented this, all the influences I had, I think, as a kid growing up. And that was, you know, I was just listening the other day, I was listening to some old um, uh, Young Bloods. <laughs> wow. It was an old, uh, just music that I liked, that I gravitated. I just, I would also on that one song, uh, Nature's Way by Spirit, you know, or, uh, Led Zeppelin. I was a huge Led Zeppelin fan, and uh, the early Allman Brothers were a big influence on me. And then, the, of course, the Beatles. Everything Beatles and Stevie Wonder, you know, in the early days were just like there was just so much interest there, and it still is. I can, and that's and that. Well, it brings me to another thing about as far as songwriting. I was talking to a guy. I gave a lesson last night. I do a lot of lessons on Zoom, and this one guy was. Um, we're talking about writing songs, and I told him I think it's even it's actually harder to try to write a simple three chord song that doesn't sound like happy birth or that isn't really yeah. childish it's harder to do that that means something than to write a song with a million chords in it i remember uh when i was at mi musicians institute i used to sit in with this guy named frank gambali who's kind of a famous jazz you know fusion guy with chick korea but we used to do this exercise where he'd say hey, hey alan what's your favorite chord and i go i don't know sharp nine chord he goes okay we'll just do this he goes what's your favorite chord point something he goes oh i like a uh, lydian sound so we just pick out out of random, like just throwing stuff against the wall and it'd be complete right. nonsense. There was no, you know, there was no concept of, oh, this melody is voice leading into this chord nicely. We were just throwing stuff that, to see if we could improvise over it. And that's to me what a lot of the fusion sounds like to my ears. I don't really, um, harmonically, there's got to be some uh, thread of, of thought or feeling through it. And you don't get that when you're just throwing a bunch of harmony out there sometimes, uh, to me anyway. And my ears, are, I think, are maybe developed more than a lot of people's, but um, so my point is that my, maybe my taste had changed for a while there. It was more academic, uh, when I first got out of MI, because I was trying to play over giant steps every day and I was trying to write the hardest stuff, but my ears kind of went back to what originally got me into, um, uh, into music, which is melody and, mm -hmm. uh, simplicity. I mean, if you can combine that, you just get so many people enjoying the moment that that's... Which goes back to the Beatles or Stevie Wonder. Wonder. Of it's course. the 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 simplicity of I was listening to Stevie Wonder um yeah. on, on uh over and over again the other day I just just I love Stevie Wonder um and he and the Beatles obviously but that's what I say a lot it's, it's the most simple the simplest song is probably one of the hardest things you'll ever write you know that's right that's right and um you know we actually I have this I have another trio in Los Angeles I play with kind of regularly called the Cookies. And it's a it's an R and B band made up of Bobby Watson. He's the bass player, the original guy with Rufus um, and Chaka Khan, and he also played with Michael Jackson, you know, uh, Rock with You, and he played Nothing from Nothing Leaves Nothing from Billy Preston. He's a, kind mm -hmm. of a Grammy winning, kind of a known guy. But Bobby's funny because Bobby he doesn't really read music, and he and he and he you know uh, he kind most of musicians don't read music actually. What I've learned. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny because I mean, he did my gig one time. I remember looking over at him. I had he had a music stand with a two page chart. I remember him just like looking back and forth, like which page am I on? <laughs> but he's a great guy. I love this guy. And Max Ann Lewis is a really great singer. We have a trio. It's basically us three, and then we the drummers come and go, um, and we just play old R and B stuff, and we do like early Stevie stuff, like before you know, before uh, even my Sherry Moore. Like, well, maybe it's around that same time, but um, 
you know, like off the talking book and music of my mind, which is some of the greatest songs ever, you know? Oh yeah. Music of my mind is what I was listening to actually. Yeah. So, so yeah, there I am. So I'm like, I, I always try to try to get some kind of melody and vibe happening in my songs. And that's, that's kind of what turns me on. <clears throat> and if it comes out good, you know, I'm really, I'm kind of happy with it, but I know as far as a ma having a manager or anybody book me, it's always been a hard sell because they don't know how to market me. I, I have friends, you know, like Josh Smith or Joe Bonamassa and they're, obviously good blues players and you know but that for me that kind of bores me after a while just because you know it, the best guys were freddie king and you know to me bb king those guys are great but it's harmonically i still want something a little more you know really i grew up as a pop guy I mean, it, it, it's hard though to get you get buried in the blues things either because there's it's just a thing if your heart's not into 100 either i mean and and your recording is differently and you do have a melody and and i, I want to say that probably i think a lot of people unless you really listen to, to it when you think of jazz, people are thinking of like really the black and white things with a hat, the beat nip, cool jazz is this thing. And it's like, you know, the joke about jazz. How do you make two million dollars? Right. Uh, I know. How do you make a million dollars with jazz? You start with two million. You know, the whole yeah, it's that old cliche yeah. thing. But the truth is jazz is in so much music. I mean, from some people is talking to Paige Hamilton with um in, in, the, in, the, in the metal band Helmet. A lot of jazz in a, in a band. There's jazz everywhere is the point, you know, and it's not the yeah. same jazz. And jazz is more of like a complex or a smart way of, of, of writing and composing and, and how you're handling the notes as well to me. Yeah. There's more com complexity in the harmony, of course. I mean, not always sometimes, you know, cause there's a lot of, uh, there were a lot of Coltrane or a lot of things that were just like, you know, one chord vamps also. When they but were, that's just it's smart playing though too. It's, it's still it's smart, smart playing. playing. The, the phrasing is smart and there's, you yes. know, Miles Davis, you know, was, yeah. If you listen to, yeah, there's always something happening there intelligent wise or, you know, and that's not to say the other stuff is not, you know, worth it is just that for me personally, I'd get bored if I just played the same pen right, right. all night long. So, um, yeah, and I even hear like there's a lot of new artists. There's one girl named Madison Cunningham. I don't know if you know who she is. Mm -hmm. She's a new artist who I think is going to be huge. And she's she reminds me of a Jeff Buckley. Uh, oh, wow. Meets Joni Mitchell. Um, she's a young girl. She's I think she's still in her 20s and she's from Los Angeles. But I went to see her a couple weeks ago at the theater downtown. She just killed me. Her interest—I mean, the, her chord changes are definitely not. They're definitely uh, several cuts above or your average pop singer, and uh, she's. But she tunes. She plays a guitar tuned down to low. I think it's like a low C. You know, she tunes really? it in, really big, It's almost like a baritone guitar. Or maybe it's like a baritone, but it's tuned down to a low C, I think. And she plays just really great chord inversions. Check out Madison Cunningham if you haven't heard of her. Yeah, um, and she's just that and starting to get really big right now she's getting ready to do a world tour i think her first but um so that kind of when i hear that i gravitate more towards that than i do any new fusion record of anybody so i don't know i'm kind of maybe i'm going through a midlife crisis that i've i've had some time off this last uh, year because uh, a lot of different things i had a because not only covid and the fact that my world has not got back because of that yet but also i had a uh, i used to play a lot of tennis and i had a detached retina on the tennis court one day where i started getting floaters and then all the guys said, oh, we get those all the time. So I like didn't do anything about it for about three or four days, which is where I went wrong. And then I finally went to the hospital and, and I've had, so it's been a year of surgeries um, on my left eye and I've got about 50% of the sight back. But uh, it meant that I laid around the house. I had to do head positioning where you can't look up, you know, for like oh. three or four weeks. We had to just like look down. I did all my emailing on my stomach and my iPad and it was brutal. I mean, the recovery was just slow and uh, and 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 no fun. But I ended up liking, you know, coming to like vodka tonics probably more than I should, and uh, and not exercising at all because the doctors wouldn't let me. Now I feel bad about my email by setting it accidentally. Anybody doesn't know when, I, when, I, when we were emailing for some reason, some of the setting made my email font so small I couldn't even read it. So <laughs> now it's like torture to you. I had to actually go back and adjust it. I don't know what it was. Well, so that's the way it was on my phone. I think when I opened it, and on mine too. I was like, okay. what the heck did I do? Yeah. I'll see I feel you. Oh, worse. My eye. my eye has gone better. I know. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it's been a year of like just kind of reflecting, kind of, you know, kind of, what's the word for it? Kind of reverse engineering what I've been doing and trying to figure out what it is I like. And I don't know. But, you know, I got this other CD uh, that I finished before COVID hit. Uh, and my manager who paid for everything said, you know, I'm not going to let you do things like you've been doing because the last, you know, the last 10, well, I don't know, uh, you know, 15 years ago or so, I was playing a lot of gigs with a lot of people doing sideman stuff. And right. at some point, I just, 
decided that I wanted to do my own thing. And so I started writing my own music. And the way I did it pretty much, I would make a CD best I could. And because uh, the first couple were really kind of hackneyed, kind of piecemeal together. And I would send all the CDs out to every, all the magazines I could. Uh, and I always got really good reviews. All the magazines always gave me four or five stars. And and on that, I was able to like book a few gigs. Just myself going through Europe uh, or going to Japan. I have a endorsement with a company exotic and they're a japanese based company so i was able to line up so that was between teaching at mi and doing sessions here at home and touring a few times a year either in europe or japan i was pretty happy and then when COVID hit all that stopped i mean there's yeah. no there was nothing to europe there is a little bit more now but uh so we made this record and my my this guy who paid for everything said we're going to do things right this time i'm not going to let you send out your cds to cd baby and to all the magazines he goes we're going to wait and get a label to do that for us so we made this i think it's a it's the best quality recorded album that's for sure um and um we got everybody from jimmy johnson and lenny castro and my band is, is featured through the whole thing which is travis carlton larry carlton's son plays bass um drummer from who played now plays with lady gaga a lot you got him donald barrett plays drums and matt Rohde, who plays with jane's addiction and a bunch of different <laughs> bands um he's on keys uh, i got mike finnegan playing a couple things in there the uh, organ player who just passed away um so i think it's great and we're waiting on it and um so we finally signed a record deal six months ago um which is awesome my first one like a little contract where what that means these days is just that they're going to put money into promotion you know there's no cd manufacturing to speak of i mean maybe a few but um so it's and they agreed to do a lot of promotion this company called srg um so uh, long story short they we we're going to add one more song to my cd um and they want to can i do a version of ode to billy joe the old bobby gentry song from the 60s which has always been a vibey song about the south and um so uh i had to do a version of that, of that live with a singer and they heard that and so now we're getting gino vanelli the famous gino vanelli from canada from i just want to stop um he's going to sing on it because he's i used to play in his band so we're waiting on that and then it'll come out and Meanwhile, I sit at home, I started playing tennis again, and I've been writing more music here and just doing sessions and kind of chilling at home trying to figure out what I want to do next, you know. Well, I, I do want to say, I think, um, first off, I, I was going to ask you about your eyes. I'm actually glad you... I, I'm no, 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 that's the point of the interview is talking. It's not um, puppet show stuff. It's mm. <laughs> the, the, the um, especially it's very, very, um, people love it, especially when it's just a podcast. They really, they really like the talking part because the silence is what they don't like. Um you your um well, your website has a lot on it. It talks about your you 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 will play on. You're available for a lot of a lot of people too, which I think is really great. You'll play, you know, on projects. You you teach, um, which I want to bring people to be very aware of. You know, check you out. I've seen you. you I've seen. You know, I came across you originally with, as I said earlier, with, with one of my favorite guitar players in the world. Is uh, another player who should be bigger is is Tim Pierce. You know, and yeah. if people people don't know him. Check please check him out also. You'll, you'll learn. So you two together is just like, um, you know, a great oh. gift. You guys teaching together. I, I love the energy of you two. Um, yeah, well, I, you know, it's it's weird because like I was saying about reverse engineering through the years, having to explain things to students, you know, you have to dig within yourself and figure out what, because sometimes it's easy to understand things. You don't really know why you understand it. You just kind of right. think you do or whatever. And, but to actually have to break it down and, and explain it, lay it out for a student makes you have to, you know, really put the thoughts into words and put them out and to try to reach a student with it, to teach them a mode or to teach them why this chord sounds this way or why this progression works this way. And that um, that's that's one thing, but the last several years, my teaching has kind of evolved into something a little, of trying to be a little more on the creative side as opposed to the mathematical side. Because there's a million, there's a million YouTube, I, I watch them every now and then, like other guys, you know, teaching stuff online and about 90% of them, I just think are just like, you know, somebody guy goes, well, if you kind of put your finger here and you do this, and that's how you do it. And, you know, and it's like they don't really tell you where the notes come from or where, or, right. you know, how you can really practically use stuff. So I've I've kind of changed my, I mean, I'm, I try to get people thinking creatively, and I try to think of a different way to approach the fretboard than just learning a pattern here or a pattern there. You know, um, I mean, I don't want to get into a lesson now, but I mean, but I mean, I try to teach like laterally, like seeing the, the, the scales on one string as opposed to all six, because the guitar is chopped up in these in tune in a weird way that it makes it harder to understand, you know, why is every place I play a C in a, a different shape on piano, it's the same place everywhere you play start from C, you know, so. Um, so I don't know, I just I try to find creative and also I try to 
it's like kind of psychology too. Just when you meet a student online, you I want to figure out where they're at and and how and where their problems are. Because a lot of times I can I can spot things immediately. You know, like a guy who's insecure, or one guy says, "Oh, I know that," and he really doesn't know it at all. You know, I can always tell when they're just trying to cover up and you know. So there's that whole psychological thing of of wanting them to go back and learn the basic stuff that they think they already kind of know or they've already touched on, but they never really got it. So, you know, it's a tricky thing, but it's kind of, it's kind of psychology one-on-one in a lot of ways. Um, it's important to, to look like that though, because you, uh, you know, you can be really good at music and just doesn't mean you're good at teaching it. You know, like an example, I was in school for recording, we go in, we have two teachers for a, a 24 track studio, right? And this is way back in the day analog, right? And then, you know, one teacher's like all over it and showing all kinds of things and the buses and everywhere. And then like the other teachers, well, listen, look at this one row right here. Will you learn this row? And you know, 24 other things now or 23 other things. Right. Let's pull it back. Let's let's make it manageable for people. Two different ways of teaching. The other guy was fantastic. He had albums. They both had, you know, platinum albums. Two different ways of teaching and not everyone got each one. Sure, exactly. And so as a guitar player, it's very important to teach people that way. Yeah, it's a good well when I was at Berkeley back in the seventies, I remember like well, I remember there was like an embarrassing moment the first day in my harmony class. Somehow I I kind of knew the basic mathematics of how scales and chords and modes were made. So I somehow spent a lot of time on my entrance exam at Berkeley. I got into a kind of a high level, probably higher than I needed to be at the time, but it ended up being good because the, I mean the first day the teacher came in and Everybody got very quiet. It was like 50 or it was a big class, you know, and, and I remember he pointed at me because I was on the front row ready to learn. And he pointed at me out of the blue and he and the, he goes, OK, give me all the notes in the C sharp minor seven flat five chord. And I just kind of froze. I went, uh, C sharp. That's all I could get out, you know, <laughs> and, the little, and the little Japanese girl next to me. She just, she, you know, he points to her and she goes, C sharp EGB. He goes, when he went around the room and he went to everybody and everybody knew every, you know, what made up chords, how many sharps were in this you know, what's the fourth mode of this major scale, all that kind of stuff. So I just went back to my dormitory room and I just just crammed and just learned all this stuff in a week. I missed memorized, I memorized all my key signatures. I didn't really know why at first, I just memorized a lot of stuff, but it made the language, at least I knew the language. So when he was talking about, you know, A flat, you know, or some, you know, the key of G having one sharp, whatever, I kind of knew what he meant, you know, I knew where, I knew why. And so, um, but I had to have it, you know, and then there's modes. I had to, I think I had modes explained to me probably 10 times before I kind of got it my own way until it kind of clicked on why theories kind of make sense and why you can use it, how you can you use it. You actually do a, a good mode thing to actually help me out was a, the basic three modes you did with him, actually. I just seen that recently, yeah. you know. That's important. That's another good example, actually. <laughs> well, it's of a, your it's teaching. A daunt, it's a daunting uh, mountain to climb. If you think about, I mean, if you even put in front of a student saying, "Oh, there's twelve keys and there's seven different modes in each one. You got to learn them all." That seems like impossible task. I mean, for a lot of people, but it's really it's repetitive, and you don't once you understand the concept, you you realize you don't really need to know every mode. I mean, I don't know if anybody's ever come to me and said, "Let's hey, we're going to jam in B Locrian today." You know, and it doesn't really happen that often, but you need to know what it <laughs> but is. But if they do, you're ready. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. But I, you know, but I don't, it's, uh, I approach it a little bit differently than, you know, than having this, you know, I practiced when I learning, I don't know, when I was a kid, first picking up a guitar, it was Jimi Hendrix and, uh, and uh, the Allman Brothers, the first couple of Allman Brothers records. And that was, I remember just learning a lot of, I didn't know what it was, but I was learning Dorian Minor. And it seemed like that worked over all of the Eric Clapton stuff I was learning at the time. And, the Led Zeppelin stuff, a lot of the scales were just that kind of minor pentatonic stuff. And so that was the first thing that just kind of fell under my fingers. As most guitar players, that's the first thing that comes, you know. I didn't um, uh, really know how to use it yet. But, you know, later on, it, it really helped, you know, to know, um, to know what that is and how it relates to everything else. I mean, some guys like Pat Martino, I think he, he would just relate. Every, like, in other words, if, if a song was in G7, he would just go play D Dorian. It's basically the same scale. It's just starting on a different note. He would just transpose everything to a Dorian pattern because that's what he kind of knew best, which works as long as you know which notes to resolve to, if that makes any sense. No, it, it does. And it's funny. I'm sure you'll probably find other people that are uh, that, that don't know, that are great guitar players or musicians that don't know anything about it. And you're like, oh, you're playing this? And they're like, I don't know what I'm playing. It just sounds good. You know, you got the, the, the musicians that are just intuitive, putting their own stuff together, their own chords together. And they have no idea why they do it, but they just do it because it's in their musical uh, brain, yeah, which is, no, sure. they don't have the language. I think that was kind of where I was when I was first playing, and then I, I got I, that, that could only my ear and my 
could only bring me so far. And I always wanted to, I remember when I moved here from uh, Alabama, I always, I was, already, I was listening to Larry Carlton a lot and Robin Ford, and I was getting into Alan Holdsworth just because he was, a lot of people don't really remember when he first came out, he wasn't only a fluid, really fast player, which is kind of what he kind of got known for being a kind of outside, really incredibly. Love, I love he, Alan. He played Arthur. super melodic stuff too. I mean, if you listen to a Jean-Luc Ponty or uh, Tony Williams, he plays the most, some of his melodies were just gorgeous in his solos, you know? And he's one of those kind of guys too, like Hendrix, that you listen to them solo and throughout their solo, you'll hear like, four or five different motifs that could be individual songs because they were just very good at making you know really nice melodies and statements and motifs in the middle of like a, a 12 bar blues or whatever you know um and his solos I and mean, he would just go he'd sound you'd hear he'd play something in a way you'd be like cool at first you'd be like it sounds like it's just like, like a car accident but when you pull it apart it's the most beautiful <laughs> thing ever you know what i'm saying like like metal music or something no i'm talking about holdsworth even oh, what i'm saying when you play You'd hear it. And I'm a huge fan of this. So I mean, you hear some people like wouldn't that aren't listening to no guitar. They're like, "What is that?" You know, like with metal music, and you're like, "No, listen to it." And there's well, so much in there. Like he wrote the stuff he wrote for himself in the later years was, I mean, a lot of it was so progressive it was hard for beginner students or intermediates to, or a lot of guitar players to hear it all because he had the real angular writing, you know, um, that kind of British thing. I don't know. But, yeah, but if I'm if I ever have a student who hasn't really gotten into Holger that says, yeah, he was technical, he's always playing outside, I didn't really like it. I say, well, you should listen to this and this. And I, I point out certain songs off of, you know, um, even that album, I think he didn't want to come out called Velvet Darkness. I think it's what it's called. The one like a big solo album. Beautiful stuff in there or Road Games. Um, the first two records just had some beautiful progressions on it and his chordal work was amazing and his solos were a little more digestible um back in the day than later on um but no he was special i mean he was in a as jimmy johnson put he said he was like in another orbit um you know he had different ways of even like he wrote from the top down you know i mean he wrote yeah. the top of the chord harmony he let Jimmy Johnson kind of put whatever bass note he wanted to after. It wasn't like if I write a song and usually thinking, okay, this is A minor, this is, uh, you know, F over G or whatever. And he was kind of just thinking the top parts of the chords and we'd let the bass player kind of come up with the bottom note, you know, and, and Jimmy Johnson, of course, is wonderful at that. Um, yeah, I got uh, Jimmy Johnson is a great bass player, probably the best, one of the better bass players on the planet as well, who will, uh, plays with his uh, day gig is playing with James Taylor. It doesn't He's, suck. <laughs> He's been with James Taylor for like the last 20 something years, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, he's told me a lot of Alan's stories and Alan was a sweetheart. I, I heard he, he, I'm sorry, he played with, I'm sorry, he played with them. I talked to Dweezil's Apple. I did some shows with him and Dweezil had him come on to do a show with him. And there was, like, I, think, I think it was like a Valentine's Day show. So, so they played some, some song that was not Zappa like at all. But they did like it's a ballad when they're being funny, like for their because you know how the, the joke is you go to like a concert, a guitar concert, it's like, you know, ninety six percent men, and, you know, and then the poor wives or girlfriends that got brought to the show, you know. <laughs> so so they said for, for this we're gonna play a romantic song, but what they did is they played the song beautiful. It could have been like I don't even know what it was like. She's like there was something ridiculous. Alan, they had Alan come out and do an improvised guitar solo in it, and you know how he was at that point was just like totally not like melodic where he did his you know way avant-garde stuff which totally threw everybody off track because <laughs> if you're not a holdsworth fan you weren't getting it which is to me right, totally right. brilliant to do that live too you know yeah he was funny. i remember i'm seeing one time at the baked potato and he's this long time ago and he started playing the first song he was just killing i think i was there with scott henderson we were there hanging out because scott and i are pretty good friends and at the time we would go out there and hear alan and different people and i think after the first song the first thing alan says was gee that sucked <laughs> and I was thinking, it was freaking genius. You know, who knows what, this is, what he was hearing in his head that he wasn't getting, you know, of course. I mean, we've all done that. I've had nights where I think it's just like, I'm playing the same old stuff and and then somebody else comes up and says, man, that was just one of my, really? All right, I'll just shut up. Well, that's hard to, to do yourself. I mean, and that's why nowadays with your, your the fan base too, you can reach out, you can play stuff and people can give you feedback instantly now, you know. Let's actually talk about... Um, your YouTube, you've said some yeah. stuff now. You're going to be doing more now. Well, yeah, that was. I mean, I, I had big plans when COVID hit. I was I was planning to do a lot of 
a lot of lesson things. And because like I said, I've seen so many, I've seen so many bad workshops at being at Musicians Institute for years. A lot of times they'd have a celebrity come to a workshop and sometimes they don't really can't really explain what they do at all. Right. And, um, and I, there was a, a great teacher there and a guy named Carl Schroeder who taught uh, keyboard and theory there. He did the jazz ensembles and he's had, he had a great sense of humor and a great way of explaining things. Um, well, I'll tell you one time we were, I was playing in one of his ensembles as a student and we were doing this song called Fee Fi Fo Fum, which is a Dwayne Shorter song, an old jazz off of uh, the Speak No Evil album. I think he did and um, McCoy Tyner and Miles Davis, maybe I can't remember everybody, but his song was, you know, he, so before we played the song, uh, Carl would explain, he would break down the song and say, okay, this, the first four measures are kind of this. It's like a five, one going to a five, one is kind of a substitute with the third in the bass. And then there's a two, five here. And then there goes to, and he goes in the middle eight bars is just blues. Cause basically it was, it was like B flat F back to B flat, you know, hmm. it goes, or something like that. So we're, so <laughs> I take a solo and we get to the middle section and I start going, playing blues. It was more sophisticated. He wanted to hear more. Uh, <laughs> you know, he wanted to hear like some B, some Oscar Peterson blues, not uh, Ray Charles blues, you know, is what he was kind of getting at, which is so I just discovered that um, uh, that during the COVID time when I started, you know, kind of get about a nice camera. Uh, I bought several cameras and actually Rick Beato finally turned me onto this one really nice Sony camera, but um, I just started making a lot of videos and I, I had, I had this whole plan and I did, I think you can find them some, I think they're in my package you can buy on my website, but I had like a truss over the top of my head so you could see my guitar from like looking over my shoulder from my point of view, which is actually a fun way to look at whenever you're it looking is. at me from here, it's hard to see where I'm going because you're looking at everything backwards mm -hmm. and you know reverse. So I had this camera angle that I had a little inset in the corner shot that I thought was kind of novel to have like a shot from like my point of view. And to me, it was, I'm surprised no, not more people do that. But um, so I did that kind of stuff. And I explained and talked about playing outside and playing over chord changes and just playing with feeling and learning the fretboard is a big topic, you know, just getting over to where you get out of the little patterns that you paint yourself into. Um, so yeah, so then uh, then came you know everybody YouTube has blown up in the last couple of years as we know, and uh, I saw Rick Beato doing um, doing a video on Joni Mitchell, who's one of my favorite artists ever. I mean, uh, I could just listen to Joni, you know, and nobody else would be happy. Um, but I, I saw Rick Beato did this one thing, so I wrote Rick. I said, "Hey, I'm a fan. I subscribed. I said I'm a." the video you, you did on Joni was just awesome. Like, you know, and then he wrote me back and said he was a big fan of mine. I said, whoa. So we became friends. We've actually Zoom, you know, I talked to him once a week or so. And he was, um, uh, he recommended this nice camera and said mm -hmm. I should start, you know, he, and we have a kind of an ongoing joke. I just know he's setting me up for it because he eventually gets around to saying, so Alan, what are you doing with your new music? And I say, oh, we're waiting for so-and-so to, you know, make some CDs. He goes, Alan, nobody's going to buy a CD. I'm, I'm telling you again. You know, there's no, you know, why get a record deal? Just do it all on you on uh, on YouTube. So uh, that kind of always comes back around to that. And he's right, of <laughs> course. Uh, so I bought this better camera that he recommended, and I started making. Um, um, I he said, you know, I, I realized from him you need a narrative. You can't just put up something just out of the you know left field right. and nobody's going to really catch on you need to have some kind of and that's why he you know has that what makes a song great that's a great narrative that you remember that you always gravitate towards and go oh i love that song by police what makes that song great let's hear it and break it down so i did what makes this guitar great and affordable uh, when i first told him that at first i i, I said hey rick am i thinking about doing a series called what makes this guitar great and he goes whoa whoa man we already have some lawsuits out there stealing my name i said and affordable he goes oh okay then so that was kind of a funny <laughs> little thing. So um, I did a few of them and sure enough in the first, you know, I made like six videos. I made actually some money from YouTube, which I couldn't believe it. Wow. Not a lot, maybe 500 bucks, but it was, I could see the future in that. And then I had my last eye surgery on this stupid detached retina. And the last one was kind of a doozy where they, they actually put a sclera buckle, a buckle, that's what they call it. They put a buckle, like a band around my eyeball to hold the retina in place. So it's been a, it's been a long recovery. That just sounds so gross to me. It is the eyeball so stuff is just oh. 
when I was on the, when I was on the operating table, I was still awake, you know, I mean, they give you enough fentanyl or whatever to keep you, you know, not feeling any pain. But I remember I kind of came to in the middle of the operation and I couldn't see anything because this eye, this eye had covered up. It's been completely covered and they had all the instruments. I could feel them dropping the scalpels or whatever on my chest because they had a big plate and my head was strapped down uh, so I don't sneeze or, you know, move right when they're doing some kind of crucial work on my lens. And I said, I remember I came to, I said, doctor, he goes, Alan, can you hear me? I said, yeah. I said, I probably don't want to see what you're doing right now, do I? And he goes, no. <laughs> and, they, and they all laughed in the room because I guess my eyeball was like out of my socket while they're putting this thing around it. Oh. And, they replaced the lens, the lens cover, and then they had to laser the retina back on. I mean, it's amazing they can do it at all, I guess, you know. It is crazy. It is amazing, though. I, it sounds but, like my worst nightmare, being yeah, strapped true. in and not being able to see. And oh. it, it was scary enough when they came at your eye with a hypodermic needle to put, they could put a bubble in your eye because um, they deaden your eye with drops. And then they have a hypodermic needle. That the first thing they just put like a, to fix a detached retina is they put a bubble in your eyeball. And that... You, that's why you have to look down because as primitive as it sounds, the gravity kind of forces the retina shut and squeezes the water. You're a better man than I am. I, I, I uh, literally, you know, you get your eye tested and they shoot the eye to test you for the, the glaucoma test. They have to get me off the ceiling just a few times before I can even do that air in the eye on purpose. So, <laughs> yeah, it was pretty brutal anyway. So, after the last surgery, I kind of quit doing my videos. And um, I haven't really got back into them yet. And I'm not sure I want to be a video guy now. I'm just, right now, I'm just kind of trying to, I've actually been trying to play tennis again. And I could finally start working out again, which felt good um, after like a year of him saying, don't even lift heavy things, you know, because they want to put any pressure on my eye. But now I've got like 50% back or so in this one eye. And I'm going to see if I can play tennis. I can drive. Um, well, that's good. I mean, and, uh, so I yeah, heard you mention that in your video, though. You said you you mentioned in your last video you did when you talked about a lot of acoustic guitars. It, be, I know, you know, you want to do it makes you happy, of course, but now some of those videos are just so fantastic, and I learned a lot. Oh. And you you're, you're well versed in it, where it's very, you know, I think one of the best types of um, YouTube yeah, shows. When you're that... you're talking to people, it feels like you're in your living room speaking with you. You know what I mean? And, oh, good. And, yeah, that's that's kind of what I. That's kind of what I wanted to do, because I mean, I feel there's some topics that get overlooked, you know, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of great guitars that the people have kind of forgotten about that were great instruments that really aren't worth that much money. I mean, whether it's mm -hmm. a put together, you know, uh, Frankenstrat or um, uh, or whether it's like some of the Ivan has always had like certain lines through the years of just really great quality stuff like the George Benson guitar is great. And the, I, I did one on the Ivan as AR 300, which was a great guitar. Yeah, um, I love Ibanez. Yeah. yeah, me too. I mean, I mean, they they made they're like Yamaha that they made such a glut of cheap stuff or affordable beginner stuff that they kind of got associated with, you know, uh, not high quality stuff just because they had such a glut of right. of product out there. But they along the way they always like the Pat Metheny guitar is great, the Schofield guitar was great. Um, you know, what's crazy is like if you look, you see the red guitar behind me there. That's an that's an Aria Pro Two. It's like a Wildcat from 1983. Um, I'm sorry, which one? The which the red one. The um, red one. The Strat right. looking. Yeah, it's an Aria Pro Two. Uh, Aria made some great stuff too. And I got Aria. that. In, it's 83. And I got it for 40 bucks off online from somebody. I'm what like, what's that? wrong with it? I looked at it and I'm like, nothing wrong with it. Somebody just didn't know nothing about guitars and they just. They made some nice jazz. I remember when I was at Berkeley in '78. One of the guitar players I knew there had an Aria. Like a copy of a L5, it was a great guitar. Yeah, um, just I just want to say that's just another guitar that no one really talks about that much anymore. It's really good music, music, you know, a good sound, good solid sound. Um, I think you should. I think you know, if if it, if, it, if the spirit moves you, you would be good doing more YouTube videos. But you gotta be into it though, otherwise it comes yeah, off. You gotta be into it. I mean, you know, Rick's. Whenever I talk to me, he's just saying, you know, do it, do it, do it. And my friends are saying do it but it you know it takes a lot it's a lot of work it, you know i have to say it is a kind of a feeling of accomplishment once you finish one you know because mm -hmm. you put a lot i put a lot of work into it and i try to you know uh, but i don't know i mean i kind of want to be no more as a guitar player of course so i've just this last uh, couple of months i've just been kind of recuperating and uh, exercising again for the first time and playing some tennis and you know i was trying to get my life back to where it feels kind of normal and then trying to figure, figure out what to do with my new cd which um which I could always play you a track if you wanted to hear something from it, but it's um, it's kind of a, yeah. it's fusion, I guess. But it's it's really it, one thing I'll say about my new CD is they it's recorded so well that I'm really 
proud of it. And band, the band I have here in Los Angeles, we played the baked potato every month or two. Yeah. Uh, it's just really wonderful. They're I'm really excited because you haven't had anything else since like 2016. 2016, yeah. So they hear the progress from then to here. As a, you know, I love when an artist has, you know, because you can tell even your other albums all sound different, which is one of my favorite things about an artist, you know? Well, I, yeah, probably so. I, I know I have just a big, um, I have a really wide influence of music I like. You know, I mean, like I said, I, I grew up listening to weird. I had bro older brothers and sisters who would always bring home, uh, you know, a Beatle, the latest Beatle. You know, I was like a little kid sitting cross legged listening to Rubber Soul, you know. Um, when everybody else had gone to sleep or um, they brought home, are you experienced when it first came out, you know, back in the sixties. And I was like, Whoa, look at this dude. You know, I, just, I thought that was the coolest thing ever, man. Just, you know, so uh, yeah, my tastes are definitely, I mean, I, I, I would never consider myself a jazz guy, even though I, jazz, I can play jazz. I understand the harmony and I can get over, you know, giant steps if you really ask me to, but that's not really that, that doesn't give me the thrill that, I get in front of an audience, a uh, small intimate audience, you know, uh, playing an original song and melody that I can tell they're all, you can feel it, you know, the energy from the audience when they're sitting there and they're all listening and getting into whatever you're doing or the band's doing. And that's a bigger, great feel. That's a, well, that's, that's what I kind of live for more than just being able to figure out how to navigate through a, a hard um, song, you know. Wow, that's fantastic. Definitely, thank you. It, it's definitely your most rock sounding. It feels like it's definitely a, a full band too. It's like yeah, it's not just favoring one thing. It's a full, full on you know group. Yeah, we. It, we I had the luxury this time of, like I said, I have a financial backer who is a fan of mine, and he just um, he said, "Let's do this right." So we went to uh, East West Studios, a famous studio here in Los Angeles, and we just sat there for a week and just recorded live. Um, I had a Jimmy Johnson, this bass player, because my bass player is Travis Carlton plays with me and Jimmy Johnson, I thought would be right for this one. So the beautiful big bass flirting in the middle is Jimmy Johnson from the Ellen Holdsworth group, of course. Yes. It's awesome, man. I'll be looking forward to it. Thanks. When it's out, we'll people look at my socials. I'll promote it for you also. I'll put it out there and help spread the word. So people, you know, are aware of it. Well, thanks. Um, well, um, you know, fantastic. That's really good sounding. Thank you. Yeah. I worked hard on this record, and I think it's um, it's got some interesting stuff on it. It's got some nice ballads. Um, it's got a real. Uh, we have a little orchestra come and play. We have one song. My I have a very Led Zeppelin influenced song. That's kind of a real heavy rocker for my stuff. Yeah, it's much more rock, you know. But I always have a few chord changes thrown in there that are a little bit. You know, when it comes out, I'll have to have you back. We'll have to dissect the songs. And I think what we'll have to do is just geek out if you want. We'll, we'll break down your songs if you want to come back and do that. It'd be fun. Yeah, um, sure. That'd be great. Be so I just, I, initially today, I just wanted people to know who you are that don't know who you are. Uh -huh. um, Thank you. Because they should, they should check you out. Um, I want to have you back again so we can talk a lot more. Um, but check out the website. Look at the links. Um, you're still teaching, right? Yeah, I teach uh, yep. every day. I'm doing a lesson here at home with somebody okay. around the world. Um, okay. I do. I still go to MI. MI Musicians Institute has not quite um, come back to full strength yet. There's still about, I don't know, maybe 60 or 70 percent up, up and running. And so I was kind of a perk anyway there. I was the I for the last 30 years, whatever, at the school, I've always been the guy who goes in there like twice a week and I do like an open counseling uh, they, is what they call it, kind of a mentoring thing. Uh, workshop where I just answered questions where I jammed with students. That's so that was the best thing about MI when I went there is that they had this thing called open counseling is what they call it. And um, when I was there, it was like Robin Ford, Larry Carlton, Joe Pass, Joe DiOrio, uh, what? Batten. I mean, you'd walk down the hallway, and that's a, every, that's who was on either side of the hallway. I mean, Joe Pass, really? I love. Oh my God. Yeah, he was there. Uh, he was, you know, he was a visiting guy. Robin, when I was there, Robin was there one week out of every month the whole year. I was a student at school. And it was right before he did, after he'd done Joni Mitchell stuff, and he would get ready to do Miles Davis, I think, or had just done Miles Davis. But Robin's there, so he and I have been friends kind of since then, acquaintances at least. You know, we talk and every now and then. Um, um, so the school, oh, so that's what I do at the school. So because that was kind of a visiting guy, I, I would only go there when I was in town or available. 
So now they they said, hey, Alan, we can bring you back in like maybe like two hours a week. I went, yeah, it's not quite enough for me to make it worth my while into Hollywood. But uh, so but I do a master class every now and then, like once a quarter, I go there and do something. And I yeah. sub for classes sometimes. All right. Just so people would check you out or, or have you use oh. a lesson or there's you know a lot what I'm of saying? YouTube, too. There are a lot of lessons. And I have a thing on True Fire. Uh, yep. Tim Pierce did something. There's a, guy, there's a guy named there was something called Guitar Breakdown. This guy locally. Uh, David Clayton did a really good job of like, man, he would learn all my solos better than I knew them. And he had transcribed <laughs> them out. And I swear, how did you learn that? I can't remember how to play that stuff anymore, you know? Um, so that <laughs> is another site. And I have, um, oh, there's a lot of different podcasts. I'm trying to get more lesson stuff. But I have stuff on my website that people can, you can, yeah. if, you like, if you like my music, you can download these stems of all the songs with me. You can mute me or just play along with Vinnie Caliuta or just play along with Jimmy Johnson. Uh, if you want to just have their tracks. And so I kind of include, there's like a little package called a play along something on my website. Okay. Um, so yeah, but I'm around. If you want to play people. tennis, if you, have, if you want to <laughs> go hit, hit, some, hit some balls. Let them know. Let them know. That's awesome. <laughs> I'll, I, want, I want to thank you for being on the show. And we'll have you back when your album's out, okay? It'd be great. Sure. Hopefully that'll be soon. Yeah. Hopefully sooner than later. <laughs> well, it's been great, Sean. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dutch.